The um, Italian intellectual and writer, Pierpaolo Pasolini, said, um, my dramatic engagement happens with everything that is paternal. So we are going to talk about this topic today, two books that deal with the paternal, with the relationship between fathers and their children. And then, you know, you might wonder why am I here? It's because I also had a peculiar father, a bit of a darker figure compared to the fathers of uh, Sam Miller and Kagi Kariu. I had a fascist and violent father who happened to have been elected as the first uh, uh, politicians with the Italian Northern League in 1977, but because he was a fascist and violent man, he was kicked out of it right away. Um, and I have stopped talking to him in 1993, and he died last Valentine's Day. Uh, I've written a novel which is uh, about a patricide, and now you, you don't, <laughs> you stop wondering why, I suppose, now. Um, but I have not killed him, he died of natural causes. But I have been very curious and obsessed about the relationship between fathers and sons, fathers and daughters. Um, uh, I think that this, luckily for you tonight, we will speak about adorable and lovable fathers. So you can relax, there won't be that sort of darkness. But this sort of darkness in the relationship with the paternal has accompanied us for um, forever, since the beginning of civilization. So uh, we are talking about a topic uh, tonight with these authors uh, that has been um, something that has been explored by history, psychoanalysis, literature, and mythology. And even in India, because in India we, you have um, Rudra, who has to kill Prajapati before a new era has, can begin, right? In, in ancient Greece, uh, the pillars of Western civilization, we have Zeus, the king of gods, who has to kill Kronos, his father, in order for a new era to start. And then in ancient Rome, you have, of course, the adopted Brutus, who has to kill Julius Caesar for a new political era to start. Um, and, uh, and so on until in, uh, into literature and too many examples to be listed uh, until we have the wonderful letter to my father of Kafka in which you know, he accuses him of being too insensitive and hypocrite towards him. So this is a common theme that has trickled into psychoanalysis and the famous Oedipus complex, you know, the need to uh, somehow face the father figure and destroy it in order to assert your own identity. And the lesser known Telemachus complex which is instead the story of a son, the son of Odysseus, who's waiting for a father figure to return from a, a, the battle and from his voyages to bring back justice. So it's the need for a father figure to come back and help us. And then the, there is the Electra complex, of course, the relationship between the daughter and, and the father. So um, the need to destroy the father figure, but also actually the need before doing that to define the father because the, uh, in the, throughout adolescence, we need a father who we need to uh, imitate somehow, a role model who will tell us how to be. A role model that very often we then need to kill, in, figuratively speaking, because we need to assert our identity. So, um, you, you see, this is something that goes throughout history, literature, and, and, uh, and mythology, but actually it's part of everyday life of growing up of all of us. So, uh, as, I, as I was saying, uh, we are going to talk today about two father, uh, to not about father figures in general who are, who are instead quite uh, exciting and positive, I think, and um, in, in very gripping read, in two very extraordinary, um, to me at least, uh, and engaging ways of telling, of, of gazing and researching the father figure. Um, so I would like to um, start this, this quest into memory uh, with uh, the most adventurous of the fathers that are, are described in the, in the two books that we're talking about tonight, Fathers by Sam Miller and Deadland, uh, A Journey into Uncharted Territory by Kagi Kariu. And, and I would like to start with Kagi because she has described this fantastic, adventurous father who uh, has been called uh, the Lawrence of Burma, after Lawrence of Arabia. And, and it's really, he lives up to the legend and the name, absolutely, because he's a... Uh, He's a very courageous undercover guerrilla of the special operation executives. Um, and he has won the Croix de Guerre and the DSO. So he's, he's uh, proven his valor in several battlefields. But I want Kagi to tell you about it. But I want to start not necessarily with his 
his, his heroic gestures, but with what prompted you to investigate in your father's adventures? Tom Carew. Hello. Can everybody hear me? You can, no. Is it on? Can you hear me now? Okay, I'll, I'll shout. Um, well, what prompted me to, I suppose, uh, investigate my father um, was that I was always aware that he had this secret, covert past. Too, too close? More like that. Oh, yeah. More like that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so he, I knew he had this secret past. I knew that um, when we went to school, and also he was um, a very unusual father in that uh, it was a bit like living in a game of poker. You really didn't ever know where you were, uh, whether he was serious or bluffing. So it, he, he, he was a, a, a very unusual character. But we had these um, newspaper cuttings um, from the Times of India um, and the New Statesman. And uh, they called him the Mad Irishman and Lawrence of um, Burma because he was a guerrilla agent that was dropped behind the lines in World War II. Uh, he uh, raised resistance and he, um, he worked very closely with Aung San Suu Kyi's father, General Aung San, in raising um, an uprising against the Japanese. So I knew that there were a lot of secrets, but it suddenly occurred to me while I was looking into this that there was a much bigger elephant stamping its foot in the room and that it, there was a much bigger human story behind that uh, and some very big characters in it. Um, and all sorts of surprises that came, that fell into my lap as these things happen. Um, but also the very kind of competitive relationship that I had with my dad and how I was brought up. So I, can I read just a very short paragraph that will give you a flavor of my upbringing and my life and sets the scene just a little bit. Um, I was going to read the preface, but I'm going to read something else a little bit shorter instead. But I have to put my glasses on and I have to hold this. Um, I've been enthralled to dad too many years. It's been hard to grow out of the need to impress, be more fearless, be wilder, be braver, be different, think differently, surprise. I knew dad was out of the ordinary and I wanted to be too. He disliked authority and taught me, by default, to distrust it as well. Dad's response to pretty much everything was usually different to everyone else's response. Rules were there not just to be broken, but to pit yourself against, to outwit. It was an intellectual exercise for him. He thought nothing of allowing us to duck out of school for a day if there was something better on. He had no respect for anything if it clashed with common sense. His, that is. On one occasion, I must have been about 12 or 13, I skived off to go riding. The next day, on the bus into school, something, the sly way Dad had licked the envelope, made me open the sick note he'd written to my teacher. One sentence. It said, I'm sorry Keggy was not at school yesterday. She had a bad hangover. <laughs> of course, I was furious. But I suppose the question is, did he know I would open it? Great, great. <laughs> so you also had a sense of humor. I forgot to mention that, of course. Yeah, it, it comes no. out through the book. Yeah, it, it, it was just this constant thing of who was going to outwit who. Um, the story in the preface is just a story about when I was very young, I was about eight, and I went into, um, we were in the DIY shop buying paint and dad didn't have enough money. And so I thought up this trick and as he was signing the check, I looked over, I was eight, you know, looked over the counter and just as he'd finished signing his name, I said, but Daddy, that's not your name. And the shop assistant looked at both of us 
And Dad looked down at me and he said, you sod. And of course, this was completely different, for the, new for the shop assistant. But I had gone up, I'd stepped on the, led, the ladder of Dad's world and gone up in his estimation. And, uh, and, but also, you know, the fact that later at the very end of the book, you know, that the, the joke about it not being his name was sort of on the money a little bit, you know, so, yeah, that was... Because he was used to interpret different identities. Well, yes, he was, yes, he used identities as he needed them. He actually taught me something not in the book. He taught me how to sign his name. I can sign his name completely perfectly because if I needed to... You could cover for him. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, but now, you, this, you were mentioning memories that you've discovered in, as part of this process. I'm wondering if you want to share with us what, what really set this into motion, which was the fact that he was beginning to lose yes. his memory, right? Yeah, yeah it, it's a parallel journey. I start this book at the end, in a way. Um, as Dad is losing his memory, um, I start to retrieve it. It's like a train going in different directions. Um, and he began to get dementia in his 80s, about 82, and it was also at a time when my stepmother died. So I not only had access back to him, but I also had access back to his attic, in which there were these metal trunks full of extraordinary material. We have to explain that the stepmother is the typical evil stepmother from the Disneyland, the She's cartoons. She's not typical. I mean, she was Even really, worse. really, really, really the most extraordinarily difficult. And that's why she was guarding sort of the secrets that yeah. you finally accessed once it was she a died. Very, I had a very competitive re relationship with my dad in a good way and a not such a good, a very, very bad relationship with my stepmother. But, you know, that, that also feeds through the book as these... This is why that the story I felt was an epic story, that it had all that kind of, those novel qualities in spades, those passionate states of possession, jealousy, grief, love, war. Adrenaline. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, definitely an, an, adrena an adrenaline cocktail of action also, yeah, let's yeah, say, because there's yeah. a wonderful descriptions of parachuting through beyond French, uh, in France, beyond German lines. And, yeah. uh, but I'm just wondering if you want to share how you felt when you had the key to the treasure box and you found those slides, those photographs. Okay, so the truth, the, well, the real truth is, I mean, I've described it in the book a bit like being Alice in Wonderland and s the bottle saying, drink me, and I drink it, and it, it really doesn't do you any good. Because there are, it was very, pain I have to say it was very painful at times, and uh, there, are ty there are things that you shouldn't be reading there that diaries that are never meant for your eyes, there are letters that are private letters between my mother and my father when they were very happy, that was very painful and sad for me. Um, there were uh, notes in my father's diaries about him meeting my stepmother way before I knew that she could come into existence. So there were all those things that you see. And also just wonderful surprises. I mean, one of the letters um, from dad when he was in Trieste was um, about his best friend at the time was Patricia Highsmith. And I have this theory, this theory, my theory, um, is that, you know, this was 1953. Uh, Patricia Highsmith is writing the talented Mr. Ripley. Um, my dad's name is Tom. They go out together all the time. They get on te really, really very well. He knows an awful lot about sailing small dinghies and, uh, and quite a lot about silent killing. Um, and although he wasn't like Tom Ripley, I'm sure, as authors do, you know, you, you, you take what you can, and uh, that's my theory about that. <laughs> that, that he inspired yeah. Tom so, Ripley of the talented well, Mr. Ripley. You know, it could, be. It could be part of the obsession that we yeah, have with our parents yeah. also. There uh, were lots of things like that, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm now cutting just forward to a uh, reunion of the old fighters in 2006. Can yeah. you tell us who the Jetbergs were? Okay, so... I started to realize how extraordinary this particular, it was a very elite uh, unit of uh, special operations executive, which was Churchill's thing to get uh, to raise res resistance behind the lines. And um, I went to a reunion after my stepmother had died. I got, re I got the invitation to go with my dad to this uh, reunion, and there were all these octogenarians. And I suddenly realized what this was about, because they were the most... 
unmanageable group. They were heckling in the speeches, swearing, walking out, getting lost, and they were all this maverick type, and uh, as my dad called, the unmanageables. And their job, they were trained to work in threes. They were um, flown uh, first in France, uh, and then later in Burma, in SOE, but first in France they were flown into um, occupied territory at night in these blacked out planes. Uh, a wireless operator and two officers, uh, one French, um, possibly one American and one British uh, team. And they had like 50 to 70 percent chance of not going back. Right? Less than that to begin with and they actually survived very well because they were so well trained. I mean that was w one of the extraordinary things, their survival rate was incredible big, but a huge surprise, they weren't expected to, to necessarily come back. Um, and it was actually incredible because, I mean, my dad was 24 and it was, he was a rebel. He'd always been a rebel and never had got on very well, but they weren't selecting people for being at the top of the class. They actually, un unknown to him, they were looking for the, uh, you know, the ones that didn't toe the line. And he could really was able to realize his full potential, his inventiveness, his going it alone, his ability to do things on his own two feet, which was an extraordinary. And in the middle of a, of a war, he got this extraordinary message from the BBC when he was, you know, he was hiding in a school teacher's house in the middle of France, the Germans were after him, and he gets this message, message personnel, in his code name, and that suddenly struck him, oh my God, the BBC is sending me a message? Uh, amazing at that age, I think. And then he got his second baptism of fire in nearby here, right? Yes, it in Burma, which he'd adored, um, and to this well, not to this day, he's not with us anymore, but yes. It he didn't have much time to recover from the French campaign, no, and he was shipped on. off. Yes, yeah, straight out. And so he was the first team to be dropped behind the lines in Arakan, which is now Rakhine State, which we've all been hearing about. Um, and he worked with Burmese guerrillas behind the lines, raising resistance, and had this most incredible operation, and worked with Aung San, General Aung San, and... Uh, absolutely loved the Burmese working there and yeah. I think the action scenes are, are fantastic and wonderful and, and, and very gripping read. Uh, there is also a good documentation of what happens of someone who lives with a, 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 such high level of risks and then comes back. Yeah. So uh, yeah, disaster. I mean, you know, the thing about it was is that it worked out, the war worked out for him really very well because he was lucky to find a position which he, where he was able. But post-war Britain, <laughs> Did, there was no call for guerrilla agents in Fairham in 1964. And, uh, you know, he never ever, there was, a, he, he, he always had this very good sort of feeling of self-worth, but that it, he was in trying to operate in a very conservative world. And so that family, he, he, he took us all with him and we all had to go on this ride, and which didn't work out so well for my mother, for instance. Or, yes, you go yeah. very much into detail in a very courageous way also in exposing what happened with the family yeah. and, and also your relationship again with the staff mother afterwards. So it, it's, there is also a, another current theme, which is of course the hero, heroism of this character, but at the same time also the private life of living with a person. So, so charismatic and so, so full of his own ego at the same time. Well, I think, I think that's where the story lies. I think it's in those contradictions of success. You can, be so, you can have the most spectacular success, but I mean, my dad would say that perfect people are not interesting and perfect, you know, they're really not. And the story is in our flaws. And even though much of the story that I had was extraordinary, that the things that I think people res that resonates in a universal way are the things, those disastrous times that we have to kind of navigate through. That can be very funny. I mean, the thing about, you know, there is laughter in the darkest times when you're able to step back and look at some of those things, like my father's dementia or some of the funniest bits in the book, in a way. But, I mean, I think that was a lot to do with his character, using what very little he had in the end. But it was very funny. But how, how have you been transformed through the process then? Because you, you hide yourself very well in this book. Because, of course, your Tom Carrier takes, takes the, the cake and takes a lot of space. But it is inevitable that you become curious as a reader 
about the author and about uh, how, how you have been changed. And obviously, it's not been an easy relationship, that's evident. Uh, so I wonder if you feel like sharing that um, here. How have I been changed? I, I mean, I think just the very fact of publishing a book helps you, a bit like my dad was allowed to be himself because he was given that sort of, you know, that tick. So publishing a book is quite helpful in a way of feeling, um, I don't know, you feel, okay, yeah, I've got that down all right. I that did okay with that. And that's, that's a nice feeling when I've had many different jobs. I'm not sure I do hide myself totally in this book. I think, I think you get a, probably a good idea. I get very angry. I let myself get angry, which is unusual in nonfiction. I, I, I don't hold back, I don't think. Um, I tell story, a few stories of things, but I try and keep to the title that it yeah. was a, a, the world of, of my dad. I think what I've found, everybody, uh, journalists, always want you to say, oh, it's been so cathartic and now I'm completely sorted and I am so not, you know, <laughs> I'm still, still the same person. But what I have got is a level of accept, I, I, I accept what, ha I, I understand it, I really understand my mother, which was very helpful because it was hard to understand her at the time. I um, have a very good relationship before she died I, and I am able to understand what happened to her life. And things fall apart. That's what happens and that's what happened. That's right. You know? <laughs> and, and, uh, which is a very good lead into Sam Miller's yeah, book. Yeah. That's what happens and that's what happens. Sam Miller, how to introduce him? I have to say, I have mentioned recently to friends in Hong Kong, in Goa, in Mumbai, where I happened to be, that I was going to be speaking with Sam Miller. And the reaction has been the same everywhere, of an, an enormous smile and, and love oozing out of their port for this man who's, uh, who's uh, evidently very much loved and, and has, has been here in India quite a while, is, a, is a, quite an expert of India, and um, who has instead definitely uh, explored all these emotions and uh, this discovery is connected to the parental. Uh, and um, I think also uh, bringing out an adventurous father figure in its own right, because your father might have not have had the adrenaline cocktail uh, action packed uh, that Tom Carew had, but I think definitely was adventure in being, an adventurous in being uh, unconventional, let's say all the father figures involved in the book uh, definitely were, were completely unconventional. So I want to uh, turn over the same question to you about what uh, prompted you to start from an eulogy to a father, uh, your investigation into the parental and into your father figures. Okay. Um, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Um, thanks, Carlo. Thanks. Peggy, um, it's, it's really wonderful to be back here um, with a very different kind of book. Um, and it's sort of slightly nerve-wracking still talking about it because it's a book which uh, is full of things that weren't talked about for many years uh, in my family. I'm people who, maybe some of those people you mentioned, probably won't remember me as someone who would talk a lot about these kinds of things. And in the time leading up to and after my father's death, something changed in me, I think, that made me care about these things and want to write about them. I wasn't sure when I began to write about them that I wanted to publish what I was going to write, but I was clear that it was something I had to do. Um, and I did it, and it is a book that for me stands as something important for me. It's not a biography, but it is largely about my father. But I'm there, my mother is there, uh, and the man who was my father's closest friend uh, for many years uh, also plays a central, critical part in the story. Um, and it's a story that I unravel or try to unravel closely through the book. And yes, writing it was very good for me. Now, a bit like Keggy, it's not made me a new person exactly, but it's allowed me to 
almost get on with other things, and that's been wonderful. I want to just begin by reading from the, from the very beginning of the book, uh, which will just give you a little flavor of the person who my father was and of my relationship with him. On the 24th of September, 2014, shortly after eating his customary lunch, hummus on toast, some prawns, and a few grapes, my father headed upstairs to his bedroom. Halfway up the first flight, he fell backwards, crashing into a wooden dresser stacked with crockery and onto the terracotta tiled floor of the basement of the house in which he had lived for more than half a century. One blue fur-lined slipper remained on the step from which he had fallen. He died two hours later. I was not there. My father had been ill for a long time, very ill at times, and that for a hypochondriac is a most shocking thing but he had recovered and I felt able to go away to return briefly to India where I had lived for more than a decade, foolishly convinced that my father would be there on my return to London. He never liked it when I went away or that I had lived for so many years in what he referred to as foreign parts. He would invariably tell me whenever I left London that the next time I saw him, he would be in a box, and he would always add, then you'll be sorry. I might have interpreted this as an attempt to make me feel guilty or to induce pity, but to me, it had become neither of these things. These words were always delivered with a roguish look upon his face, and they became his circumlocutory way of saying how much he missed me a piece of repeated nostalgia, a self-quotation, a turn of phrase he always used and always would use until the day he died. It was something that I told my friends as a way of describing my father's uncommon sense of humor, and they didn't always get the joke. For this was gentle teasing on the part of a literary hypochondriac the same man who had written a good 15 years before he actually died this autobiographical couplet. No poor soul was ever iller than Carl Fergus Connor Miller. Thank you, Sam. This is a very moving, surprising, and, and full of love, this book, it is. I mean, it's, and it's also filled with a lot of forgiveness and understanding. I mean, it's a, this is what I find more, most touching, aside from the anecdotes and the, the, the different phases of your discovery, traveling and through time and sometimes through space as well. And that's why I just wanted to know what, what first clicked in. Uh, was it the, the fact that you weren't there? by chance, or was it the fact simply that he was gone that, that, that made you want to put some order and, and put it in, in your memory and, and write it? It was almost sort of, to use that overused word, sorry, it was almost, to use that rather overused word, visceral. When he died, I had to do something. And the next bit in the prologue is a story I wrote about him that I won't read out now, but which I wrote for my children about my relationship with him and that I then read out at his funeral. And maybe it's just something about me, but it's the way I can explain how I'm feeling. Uh, and it was to do that that I wrote. Uh, there was an investigative side to it as well. Uh, there was spending a lot of time with my mother trying to uncover some of these stories. There is still a strange mystery at the heart of my father. Um, I think I've got as close, perhaps, as I can to him. He had a, a very different upbringing from me. He was, a, he was born in a small mining village outside Edinburgh in Scotland. He was deserted by his parents. He described himself as an orphan. 
He was brought up by his grandmother and his aunts in an almost totally female household. There was one other male who was a mentally retarded uncle with whom he shared a bed for his early years. They had no money, uh, but strangely enough, they always had books. Uh, there were books around, borrowed books, given books, uh, and it was an extraordinary literary household, even as a child. Um, my father uh, became a scholarship child and did well and went to university and all of those things. And he describes, for instance, he was, how amazed he was to discover that upper class people also read books. <laughs> because he thought they hunted and fished and rode horses and wouldn't have had Which time they <laughs> for something as boring as, as books. Anyway, he goes to Cambridge, he meets my mother, he meets a whole range of uh, other people, a lot of whom became lifelong friends. And he enters this strange literary world uh, and becomes a, a, a he was never famous, he was never recognized on the streets, but his, he certainly had a reputation for And prestige. And a prestige, yeah. A reputation for discovering or being the first publisher of lots of poets and writers who are famous today. And I think in the outside world, that's probably how he was, Perceived. he's remembered. Um, you know, a child growing up in that, situation doesn't notice that at all, but he was always um, very different from every other father I knew. He was gloriously, happily impractical. He literally could not change a light bulb. He would sit in the dark waiting for my mother and then later his children to come and do it or just move to another place where the light bulb was working. He, when he went into the army, he um, had to do a, a, a test to become an officer, and the test involved reassembling a bicycle pump, and he got zero out of ten. And he loved that story. He wasn't embarrassed by it. Uh, and I think throughout his life, he was comfortable with being different. That didn't mean he kind of ignored the outside world uh, and its expectations. Um, and my mother used to tease him and his friends for being men of destiny who wanted big jobs and so on. And they got their big jobs so often. Um, it wasn't just him who was different, it was the whole context was a bit bohemian. Well, I think there was an interesting context. I think there's something to be written about a post-war era which suddenly freed everyone. That free, well, it didn't free everyone, it freed the men. It didn't free the women till quite a lot later. And this and group still now, of, maybe. Yeah. A little bit more well, I tell slightly the story of my mother's liberation coming later, and that's almost the crux of the story. But those came, he, I went to Cambridge and hated it, and he could never understand that because it was the greatest time of his life where he met the people who would be his lifelong friends. Um, he met, among the people he met there, were, was someone who plays a critical role in this book, uh, a man called Tony White, who died in 1976, and who I remember as my father's best friend. Um, they, played, they set up a football team together in the late 50s. Neither of them were really footballers. I think they thought it was a romantic thing to do, and my dad thought it would keep him in touch with his roots. Um, and things like that. But... What is it, the Battersea? It's called, it was called Battersea Park. It, it, I played for it in the 80s. It went on until about 10 years ago. And there are various sons and grandsons who would like to reinvent it and start again. But some of us are getting a bit, um, bit old for that anyway. Um, so that, the, so the, the, the first third of the book is in a way a story of my father and his world. Um, and then I shift to something that I've, in a way, been building up to. Um, 
which is to tell the reader <laughs> something I've obviously known all along or have known since I was 15. And I'm just going to read the bit from the book that describes that. Just the start. moment of discovery of some sort of uh, epiphany that you might have had in your uh, research. Well, it may not have been an epiphany, but it's what happened to me when I was, sorry, I'm reminded that I, yes, I was 15. You'll all be able to work out my age from the next sentence. Um, in 1977, I learned a secret. But the secret was about me, though in another way it didn't really feel that it was about me at all. It was about my friends and about the man I had always thought of as my father's best friend, Tony White. I learned the secret at the start of the summer holiday. I was 15. My mother and I were painting my bedroom a forbiddingly dark shade of blue, almost indigo, that I had chosen, presumably, to represent my outlook on life. The bed and the floor were covered with old white bed sheets to protect the carpet and my furniture. I remember feeling a little sick from the smell of paint. My mother told me to drink some milk to line my stomach. I left the room and walked along the corridor to the kitchen and pulled an unopened bottle of milk from the fridge. I removed the silver cap by pressing it down with my thumb and drank, as I always did, straight from the bottle, swallowing the full pint. I returned to the bedroom and leaned over to pick up the paintbrush again. My, father, my mother said, with a slight catch in her voice, there's something I want to tell you. I turned to her, a dripping paintbrush in my hand. Your real father is, was Tony White. I remember responding with silence, which seemed to linger as my mother waited for some kind of reaction from me. The blue paint dripped onto the white sheet and I stared hypnotized by the spiral pattern it made. Once spoken, of course, my mother's words could not be retracted, and those words set off a slow-motion cascade of feelings and reactions and consequences. More of that to follow. First, the story in its striking brevity. My mother at the time told me the thinnest of tales, that she'd had a love affair with Tony and that I was the result she has said that my father knew about this from before I was born and that he'd always loved me as his own. That's... So <laughs> this opened up a whole new narrative yeah. uh, because it opened up the need to discover how this happened, which, uh, as you tell in the book, yeah. it happened the first time in 1958 during an Italian vacation, mm. which is a very much of a Patricia Highsmith uh, context. Uh, it feels like we're going back to uh, Tom Ripley somehow, yeah. in which he betrayed your father's trust. And then there is some sort of uh, rapprochement, there is some sort of, yeah. which you re rediscover and tell us through letters, some of them missing in which you have to induce what they say, yeah. and some of them instead that you have and explain the close relationship between, between these two men. That at, yeah. at one point you even describe as almost homoerotic, uh, especially during their uh, football games at Battersea Park. Uh, and then that your father was not happy about you hinting at that. Do you think that there was something of the sort in that friendship that, that, that was filled with forgiveness and, and in somewhat acceptance of what happened with your mother, right? They did have an incredibly intense relationship. Um, and they would go on holiday together prior to me being born. Actually, not that long, about 15 months before I... I was born after my mother had had a f an affair for the first time with Tony White. Um, there are letters that survive from uh, my biological father to Carl Miller, the man I've always thought of and think of still as my father. And they're absolutely, in my view, extraordinary letters. Uh, I don't have my father's replies to them, but you can read them in terms of what Tony says in the next letter. Um, and 
I found them carefully organized with a little note saying what the dates were on top uh, quite soon after my father had died and uh, I felt he'd set those aside for me to see and that he wanted me to see them. Um, and indeed it did help me really piece together how that relationship was. They were very different kinds of people. My uh, biological father was half French. He'd lived in a, he went to a public school. He went to a, um, uh, he was in the army where he taught people to drive. He was very practical. He would, as I knew him, he worked as a builder who would come round and fix things in our house. Um, and almost sort of went completely the other way and ended up living a lot of his time uh, on a small island off the west coast of Ireland. In Connemara, uh, right? In Connemara, right. that's right. So, yes, these, these two figures almost cross identities at a certain point. And, of course, there is my mother at the heart of all of this. It's fascinating because your father was also somewhat obsessed with the idea of the double, and, and later on, then, when you investigate the fact that he, he was, Carl Miller was, in a way, holding Tony White as his double somehow, right? In a, in a literary way, but also in his existential way. Absolutely. I feel with both these men, and this is the difference from the, what the women could do in the 50s, had a point where they could choose their lives and choose what kind of lives they wanted to lead. And... Uh, my my um, biological father was a very successful actor for a few years um, and spoken of very highly and working at the old bit and then just dropped out and decided that that was not the kind of life he lived, he wanted to live. My father thought like that as well, in large part because his father, his own father, a painter, had dropped out. So it was as if these men, sort of in their 20s, were almost self-consciously saying to themselves, I could do this in my life, or I could do that in my life. And my father, in a sense, my Carl Miller, decided he would be a householder, and he would have children, and he would be married, and he would have a job, even though he was the most, in many ways, unconventional of fathers. It really was as if they had exchanged identity was Carl Miller rose in society mm. and where, whereas Tony mm. White somewhat decided mm. a form of exile mm. by becoming a handyman and going to mm. Connemara. Uh, I'd like to join the two books and see what the two thing, the things that they have in common. One of them evidently aside from the uh, need to search and define the father are the female figures actually. For me what I found fascinating has been the fact that both in your mother's case and your mother's case and your stepmother, they are the, the women are the holders of the keys of the secrets of the father. And so the ones who build a barrier and protect. Did you feel like uh, you had been shielded from certain truths by your mother as maybe Sam also has been or not? Not so much, not in, that, not in that way, because, I mean, my mother was quite a very fiery person and she would be very quick to be, you know, she, I mean, from very early on. Um, I was rather proud of the fact that my father was a bastard, a real one. Uh, that was <laughs> a, a sort of a badge of kind of honor, but, I mean, it was quite an extraordinary thing. In, in 1919, he was born in Ireland in the middle of the Irish War of Independence, and that was... Uh, quite a scandal at the time, and his his life seemed to be one scandal after after another, which he thrived on. Um, my mother was sort of drawn, sort of dragged. Well, she escaped from a very quite an upper class English um, con uh, family. Uh, they were the last breath of the Raj, really. Um, my my grandfather was killed in a light airplane crash outside Delhi. Um, they were a pretty terrible lot, I thought, when <laughs> I was unraveling their story. Um, very cold upbringing my mother had. W the outside was full of, uh, full of uh, um, privilege, but it was actually a very cold time where she, she was um, very on her own as a young girl and uh, actually even was sent on a boat mm all the way from England to India to collect her dead father's things at the age of 
15, six, just going on 16, in the middle of the war. I mean, quite astonishing things that I, I found. I don't know whether Sam found the same thing, but I found that writing a non-fiction book, there are things that would never survive in fiction because they would be unbelievable, and I kept finding those but things. But your stepmother definitely shielded you from certain access even to your father, yeah, right? No, well, she did, yes. I mean, my, my stepmother... I, I had a, a, a problem, a, a dilemma, not a problem, but a dilemma about my stepmother because we didn't get on, and yet in writing the story of my father and our family, um, I could hardly leave her out because she was such a, a very strong governing part. Um, and I try and un unpack that to a certain extent, but I, fi I always find the best way is to is really just to retell things as they happened, the, you know, choose the telling detail. Um, and sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're excruciating, um, but they're chosen for a reason that they I, tell something. In your case, your, uh, Sam, instead, I think your mom went into analysis. It allowed her to talk about the affair she had and which uh, allowed her to open up and attempt a novel even to reconstruct what had happened to her. She, uh, wrote, she did. She wrote a novel which... She never showed anyone until she showed it to me about two and a half years ago, um, which I think was one of her ways of dealing with it. She wrote it um, between the period when Tony died and the period she told me uh, about that Tony was my biological father. And so I think it was her way of dealing with that period. She didn't go into analysis. Um, she had to go and see psychiatrists when the issue of bo both of these men in my family, uh, of both of my fathers, gently suggested when she told them that she was pregnant that she might um, consider an abortion. Um, and she went along, you had to get a psychiatrist to uh, approve, it. approve it in those days, and she went to see a psychiatrist and she explained about um, these two men who had set up a football team together and who she was very keen on and she wasn't at that stage absolutely sure who was the father. Um, and the psychiatrist said back to her, I think you're the football here. Um, and, and, uh, and she, well, in one telling, she has many tellings of this, in one telling of the story she says that's the moment I decided <laughs> I'm carrying my decision. I'm making a decision for the first time, and and uh, and I was the decision. We wouldn't. We wouldn't. Yeah, lucky we wouldn't for you, exactly. Yeah. Lucky for all of you. Yeah. <laughs> We're leading up to question time, and, and very very few minutes. Just one final question to both of you about the process, of course, about what has happened to you. Do you feel somewhat cured of your the complication of the relationship with your father? through uh, the process of having written such uh, touching uh, books, or is there something still unsolved? And was it in a way also bringing out the issues of your own mortality facing your immediate uh, father, uh, relative's death? Um, I'm not sure about that one. I think that um, you always do think about, you know, you're the, the next, I think when, when your father dies or your any parent dies, you, you're, you're faced. You're, my, my grandmother said you're in the front line now. Yeah, you're, th you're the front line, you're the front line. I, I mean, with my mother, um, who ended up um, having a very, very, very serious nervous breakdown and ended up being sectioned, and uh, that was a, another part of the story. Um, but watching her drag, literally drag herself out of that and um, give her, at the end of her life, she gave back her children, us, the best gift that she could, which was her best self. And that was something I didn't think I would ever see. And writing about that was a very, very good thing for me. I mean, it was a very good thing. Um, but I'm not sure about, ooh, I'm not sure about whether I've, it, it, well, there's always a sense of regret about certain things that you certainly wish that you'd asked. I mean, some of the stuff that I found out about my dad, I mean, one of the things uh, it strikes me, um, I remember uh, telling him I wasn't going to university. I mean, I was always not doing something and I was rather footloose as he called me and, and I ran off to South America for two years in 1976. 
And uh, I had to, he was living in a van at that time, and I had to go and ask him, uh, uh, tell him I was not going to university after all. And he laughed, and he got a box of wine out, and he said, if you get into trouble, um, look, look up this guy here. And he gave me, wrote down an address, and gave me this address. And then he roared with laughter because he knew I wasn't going to believe him the next day. I said, who's that dad? Who's Bill Colby? And he roared with laughter and he said, oh, it's just the director of the CIA. <laughs> and one of the great, my great regrets is I didn't look up what the last great spy master I could have done and I didn't. Although you did use that information, but we won't tell. He did save my life inadvertently, which... <laughs> They'll have yeah. to buy the book and read you about that detail. you have to buy detail. the book and read that, yeah. And what about you, Sam? Just before we start taking questions, it's about question time. Uh, do you feel like you have found some of the so-called closure to the morning? Uh, uh? No, I mean, no. I mean, what I think I've done is tried to catch him, catch him before my memories started to fade or be trapped in the memories of others or one of the things I was very clear there were various lovely obituaries about my father but they weren't for me him at all yeah. and I and almost because of that I needed to get it down I needed also to talk to the others who were still around who remembered him um, and in some ways the more important thing was actually happened just before his death is that I spent the last six months of my life with him. Um, and quite a lot of that is described in the book. And there's no better decision I've ever made, as far as I'm concerned. And that may apply to some of you who are in those positions. If sure. you're very close to that person, for God's sake, get that time with them. Yeah. Ask, and ask all the questions. Well, right? I, I, <laughs> questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you have to ask the questions. <laughs> One here. Thank you for that. Um, both of you um, spoke very movingly and affectingly. Um, my question is someone who hasn't read either book, um, who met both of you yesterday, knows nothing about your stories other than what I've heard today is, um, runs as follows. If there were someone in your family or someone close to you who, were, who was acquainted with this story, who having read your book, turned to you and said, you've had a certain amount of trauma, your internal life has been um, troubled and required a lot of thinking, so is mine. I've spoken about my trauma, I've gone to I've even sought professional help. I've taken up a musical instrument. I've discovered a way of dealing with this past. What you've done is to take something that I consider hugely private and put it in the public domain. So my question is to you, if, and that, that would be said to you in a slightly accusing way. What would your reaction be, both of you, to that? Shall I start? Yeah, sure. um, my reaction is, is that I think every, to be a writer, I think uh, Graham Greene said, you know, you need a splinter of ice in your heart to be a writer. And I certainly had to find that in mine. I think you need, a certain, um, you need a certain amount of empathy and also ruthlessness. But I also felt with my story that it had these universal... I mean, I read, there's another cliche, I suppose, not to be alone. And I think that there are a lot of things that I wanted to talk about, difficult relationships um, that I think are helpful. I had a lot of, I've had a lot of letters about dementia, for instance, and some absolutely brilliant letters about people going through a parent or, or a husband or, or wife with dementia. Um, but I think the difficult relationships, I mean, I was lucky, everybody, there was nobody alive that I was treading on anybody's toes and there was no close, close re relatives apart from my own brothers and sisters. And um, I was there, I'm very lucky with my brothers and sisters. They're very generous and allowed me to take the story of my father, which was all our stories. Um, but it was because it had those passionate states that, and the, and the, why we read novels that I, that I went into the human side of the story. And um, I, as long as it was authentic, everything had to be as credible as I could possibly 
uh, humanly possible. So I, yeah, um, that I think that's all one needs in my book, anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's very important that we're able to answer that question. Um, for me, it was written as, a, in a sense, an internal document. An early draft was more in the form of a conversation between my mother and me. Um, my mother had an absolute veto on it. Um, she had written about her own parents uh, before and is a writer. So I think I also knew, though she had that veto, she was likely to support it in the end, though I think she had moments where, I think particularly just before publication, where she was very nervous. I think other members of the family who were not so directly affected did have concerns that almost reflect the tone of your question. Um, and it wasn't always easy I think now it is. I think it's all fine. Um, uh, and that's, in a sense, all I would, all really I would say about it. I don't think there's an answer that it's right to do it or wrong to do it. It really does depend on those circumstances and those people. And whether any of you are going to be interested in it and whether it's publishable and so on. It wasn't written for publication. It was written for me, and it's been published now. And also, sense of privacy has changed uh, uh, lately, so there's probably one more question here. And then one here, if we have time. No. Hi, uh, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, first, here, yeah, Kelly. Uh, first one's for you. Uh, do you think it's important for a, for a writer to maintain a certain distance when you're dealing with a deeply personal subject such as yours so that your own experiences don't overpower your writing? You have to speak louder. Speak in the mic. Is it better? Yeah. Okay, so when you're tackling a very personal subject, such as yours, do you feel it's important to keep a certain distance, be detached from your subject, uh, so that you know, it doesn't really overwhelm you personally? Um, I think you do need distance, and then you have to get incredibly close. So you need distance to get to, to have that sort of cool objectivity. And then for me, I had to literally step back into my teenage years and relive some of those things that happened um, to really, really understand what happened. So both, both things, I think, you have to have that distance and... Thank you. Um, thank you. We are out of time, unfortunately, but the writers are here and the books are in the bookstore, so you can go and meet them there and sign and they'll sign the books for you, right? And uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Kagi. Thanks a lot, everyone. The Jaipur Literature Festival, powered by AU Small Finance Bank. We thank our sponsor, the title partner. Powered by AU Small Finance Bank, Venue Partners, Bank of Baroda, Cox and Kings, Rajain Kalachan, Amity University, Jaipur, Rajasthan Tourism, Tanishk, Course Partner, Detol Banega Swachindia, British Council, Dove.